And now uh, tonight's program. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Laz Skangas with his presentation on George Pullman and the Pullman Company. The full title is uh, beside me here on the screen. Uh, Laz is a practicing architect in the state of Vermont specializing in historic restoration. He's been involved in the restoration of the Central Vermont Station in Swanton, Vermont, and the Central Vermont Station in Waterbury, Vermont. And he's currently the president of the Champlain Valley chapter of the NRHS based in Burlington, Vermont. So Laz, welcome aboard, and we look forward to seeing your program. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, this program was a two-part program that I did for the Champlain Valley chapter uh, last year. Um, so I've kind of combined it. I did it kind of the last minute, so hopefully there won't be any glitches, but if there are, there are. Um, you're going to find an, a couple of references to the Central Vermont Railroad and the Rutland Railroad and Canadian National. And part of it was because it was a presentation for our chapter. Um, so we'll begin with the first part, which was George Pullman and the Pullman uh, Palace Car Company. We will talk later about the Pullman Porters and what their duties were. And they're the ones that really made the trains run, um, especially for the passengers who were taking uh, Pullman car service. George Pullman was from a family in New England. They were carpenters and car cabinet makers. Pullman was the third of 10 children. He was born to Lewis and Emily Pullman. His father was a cabinet maker, but business wasn't doing great. It was hard to support 10 children. New York State at the time decide, decided to widen the Erie Canal, which required relocating houses and warehouses and other buildings. So he picked up his family and moved them to Avalon, New York in 1845. So he could start moving houses. And he actually came up with a patent on how to do this. And you can see the diagram here on the right uh, of the slide. He started doing that, business was good. And then George joined and helped, working right beside his father, often down in the mud. Although impeccably groomed, the young Pullman was always read to do what was necessary to complete assignment fully, but he was known for following a tough job by cleaning up well and soon promenading in all his glory with a high top hat and a low tail coat. However, he was always motivated to return to the grubby work the following day. When George was 22, his father died and as the eldest unmarried son, it was necessary for him to support his mother and his brothers and sisters. And he ended up getting a 20 building contract from the state of New York the following year to move buildings on the Erie Canal. However, he saw this as not a long-term solution. He needed to find something else because you can only wind the canal, you can only move so many buildings before you have to move on. He picked up his family and went to Chicago. Chicago was in the midst of redoing their sewers and water because they built Chicago. It was on the same level as Lake Michigan. In high winds, the roads would flood and the buildings would flood. In 1857, the city council passed an ordinance to raise grade of the streets bordering Lake Michigan and Chicago River by four to seven feet. Pullman arrived in 1857. Chicago was a town with streets and sidewalks of uneven height. And you can see right here, this is a road in Chicago at the time. Uh, it was all muck and everything. And you can also see a sample of them putting buildings on rollers and moving the buildings. And then also this was an advertisement uh, for people to come and raise the building. So the success, successful draining of the notorious swamp with installation of sewers and putting down gas and water pipes, followed by the elevation of paving the streets was not entirely happy developments for owners of businesses lined in these streets. For partners of costly shops found their property now below grade without direct storefront access or visibility. Rather than lose high rents, 
It could command for a first floor commercial space with show windows and street level elevations. Owners were willing to pay top dollar to lift their buildings. And you can see two examples here, you know, the road's been raised and you're almost at the peak of a building here where the sidewalk is here. And then here's another building where there's a set of stairs that take you down to what used to be the first floor. It stood the reason that the resourceful Pullman, that if a building can be moved to a new location like he did at the Erie Canal, he figured out why can't you raise it? And he was not alone. There were others that would join him as colleagues or competitors. This is the Briggs house. And you can see all this cribbing. What they would do is they place basically corkscrews underneath the building and raise it in its entirety. And this is what they're doing here. They would disconnect it from the building next door and lift it. And as you can see, people, as you can see right here in the balcony, stayed in the building. Because uh, this work took over a number of weeks. They did a couple of inches each day. One of, his, one of the biggest ones that he did was Lake Street between Clark and LaSalle, where they raised the entire block at one time. It took 600 workers and 6,000 jack screws. Again, buildings remained occupied after Pullman and his team managed to lift the stretch of Lake Street buildings more than four feet in five days. Without disrupting businesses, they installed a new foundation beneath the block it was as if though the businesses had always existed at this new height. Of course, you probably couldn't do that today. A year later, steel magnate Joseph Byerson was still marveling at the achievement when he wrote that a feat of mechanical operation the country had never heard of before. The business on the block went on as usual. Not a pane of glass was broken, nor people were aware of the movements, so gradual was the process. The next building and the last one that he did was the Tremont House, which was another hotel. This was in 1861. It took 500 men to raise the hotel by six feet, and each man on a signal gave 10 screw jacks a half turn until the building had been lifted to the desired height. I think it's pretty mind blowing that you could do this in fact, there was a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, Timothy O'Hall, who was staying at a week in the hotel. At the end of his stay, he said to the front desk, I'm sure it's my imagination because he didn't realize they were raised in the building, but he said, your steps out front seem to have gotten taller. And I remember when I first came here, I could see in the windows and for some reason, they're a lot higher now. Did you guys lower the street or am I missing something? So Pullman made a ton of money to support his family and was actually pretty wealthy at this time doing this kind of work. So legend has it that while spending a sleepless night in a rudimentary sleeping car in the 1850s, it occurred to Pullman that with minor but fundamental tweaking and significant upgrading, an uncomfortable journey could be made not merely tolerable, but luxurious. But he didn't know if this was true. He decided he was going to create the world's best, greatest sleeping car. Sleeping cars back then were basically upright chairs. They were just the coach. Some cars, the seat could pull down, but it was about it. So he got together with a Benjamin Field and they decided to buy two cars. It cost them about $2,000 a piece. They were going to redesign and do a sleeping car. The other person who joined them was Field's brother, Norman, who lived one time in Pittsburgh, Vermont. But Pullman felt he needed more money to do this. Even though they were designing the cars and working on it, it was the time of the gold rush and the silver rush out west. So he decided to go out west and make more money. So George Pullman 
and Philip Amore of the Amore Food Company decide to go out west. They wanted seed money, so they headed out west. Armour went to Leadville, Colorado, and Pullman went to Central City. Other people there at the time was Levi Strauss, who made the jeans. John Studebaker went out there to raise money. Leland Stafford and Mark Hopkins, who you probably don't know, but they were big time Chicago real estate developing people at the time. John and William Borden were part of the Hopkins and meat processing. They went out there. Marshall Field and Levi Lettier did not go out, but they bought silver mines and made money. When Armourer went out there, he found that people needed water to do their panning for gold and all that, so he bought property. He controlled the water and sold water to the miners so he could do their, they could do their prospecting. When Marshall Field and Levy did, as they financed boarding and his brother, and then less than six months, the four of them made a total profit of $4 million. One of the first cars before Pullman did his sleeping car was what they called a shelf or bank, a bunk cars. Here's an article from a correspondent who took this ride. And he says, imagine an old fashioned passenger car with the insides torn out. And in their place, two benches running lengthwise of, of the passenger car, oh, sorry, of the car. The only modern survival sufficiently wretched to be compared with the, are some of the side seated concerns which lurch and wobble up and down the Harlem and New Haven roads to suburban places. Even these less venerable survivals of primitive railroad development are quite agreeable vehicles compared to the dingy, dim lidded sleeping car of the year before the war. The real misery of these cars was not where you sat sideways and alternately slid into your neighbor's lap or onto the floor. The real suffering began when you turned to, into what the truthful James of the advertising departments of those days termed your luxurious night repose. The sleeping car of 1859 where the bursts were made up at night was sort of the worst features of the black hole of Calcutta and the hole of an African slave. The bursts were made of three-decker style, one above the other, from the floor to within a few inches of the roof of the car. The beds were made up with macaroni mattresses, sheets were none, pillows there were none, you had a blanket to cover yourself, and a greasy, shiny hair cloth bolster to lay your head to. To slide in between these shelves and to slide out for them required the skill of, of a contortionist. So needless to say, they were not fun rides. And here's a drawing that shows those uh, bank, bunk style or shelf style bursts. Pullman in 1859 came up with his first two cars. He called one old number nine and one old number seven. These were cars that he bought and reconfigured. They were coach cars and they, re and they reconfigured them. He had a partner, Benjamin Field. Benjamin Field had a brother and they went to Chicago to help them build these cars. They were a three man company. George Pullman would send his profits back to Benjamin and Norman Field to work on the cars as they were converting them. They were basically taking two existing cars and converting them to 10 lower berths with 10 upper berths and a bathroom at each end. And that's what they were working on at the time. George basically had a repair shop out there, sold goods and basically in a month with $300,000, which in that time was a ton of money. The other thing that happened is that when Pullman came back from the West, he got drafted into the Civil War. So he did what a lot of rich people were doing. He would pay someone else to go in his place. So he did not serve, but he sent someone else. Now we don't know if he died or if he lived or who he was. So here's a picture of the car and there's a picture inside of the replica. In this case, you're just seeing coach seats. The bursts come down from the top by pulleys and weights. 
they came up with a design and they got a patent on it. It basically was the seats would fold down. They would take the mattress that was stored in the upper berth and put it down and the upper berths would fold down and be held in place with ropes and pulleys. They did this, they did these two cars and basically leased them to the Chicago and Alton Railroad. So these were seats that folded down and you can still see the armrest and they would lay a mattress along here and then the upper berth would come down, they'd throw a mattress on top and that would become your sleeping car. So here's a view of the lower section that's been laid flat. So, and here it's regular coach service, but at night they would lay these flat, they take a mattress and put it on top, the armrest would remain, and then these upper berths would be lowered so you could sleep at on top or you could sleep below. Then in 1865, he came up with his Pioneer. His Pioneer was a car that he started from scratch. Upon returning from Colorado, he struck boldly, boldly, commenced to fabricate from the ground up his first sleeper. This was to be his very own car, not a made over version of some crude coach or a shelf bunk car. With the help of draftsmen, carpenters and skilled mechanics, he produced the Pioneer. It incorporates what was for the day an elaborate and luxurious interior design to provide maximum comfort. The Pioneer was a little more sophisticated. The upper bursts were hinged and folded down. So during the day they would be closed and then during the night they would fold down. The, the coach seats would actually fold out the cushions and then they would raise this back to give you a little more privacy. And you can see here where the back is extended versus here when it's a regular coach seat. And then here you can see some of the weights and pulleys that lower the upper berth. Here's a picture of the outside of the Pioneer and actually a picture of the inside. The Pioneer as he dubbed his second design was wider and taller that anything that came before and used trucks with rubberized springs to reduce bouncing and shaking. Thick curtains or silk shades covered the windows and chandeliers hung from the ceiling, which was painted with elaborate designs. The walls were covered in rich dark walnut. The seating was covered in plush upholstery and the fixtures were brass. During the day, the sleeper looked like a regular, if especially lavish, passenger car, but during the night it transformed into a two-story hotel on wheels. Seats were unfolded into the lower sleeping berths, while upper berths, instead of lowered from the ceiling on pulleys, folded out from the side. Sheets and private petitions were installed on the Pullman's orders to complete the effect. One of the problems that Pullman had is that he didn't have enough height and he didn't have enough width. So he raised the car and he made the car wider. While this created, well, this created some problems because existing railroads and where their stations were, they couldn't move their stations. So they had to move their track to accommodate them. And if there were any bridge overpasses, the bridges were too low. So he didn't think he was gonna be successful and didn't know what to do. According to American scientist invention, Pullman said, my contribution was to build a car from the point of view of the passenger comfort. Existing practices and standards were secondary. However, at the time, Lincoln was assassinated. And of course, Lincoln had his funeral train. It left Washington and before it went to Springfield, it went to Chicago. Well, it stopped in Chicago and on its way there, there was a committee who got the train to stop. On this committee was Borden, who was one of the people who went out west and that happened to be Pullman's banker. Marshall Field was on the committee, who was a close friend of Pullman's, and they basically convinced the people who were controlling the Lincoln train that the Pioneer, which was the car Pullman designed, would be put on the back of this train from Chicago to Springfield. 
So the Chicago and Alton Railroad was now forced to move their tracks away from the station and increase their bridge heights to accommodate the train. So the other piece of this is Ulysses S. Grant had heard about this car and said, I'm coming out west and I want to ride in this car because I'm sick and tired of riding in cars that aren't comfortable. And I want to take it from Washington to where I'm going. So this forced other railroads to accommodate the width and height of this car, which just in my mind staggers the mind that they even would consider this. So they got a patent, it was Fields and Pullman that got a patent for their burst. And you can see one in the down position. Uh, you can see it, it folds down, mattresses, pillows, and you can actually see the lower berth that's been made up while this front seat here is as a coach seat. The other piece that was going on at the same time was Allen uh, had developed a paper car wheel. And basically it was a steel tire with two steel plates, but within the steel plates was crushed paper. And Pullman always felt his cars, the ones that had the best rides, were the ones that were on this paper car wheel. This was in effect for about 20 years. This is the type of wheel that was used. Allen became a partner with Pullman. And then here's a cutaway of that wheel and basically crushed paper was installed between the two plates. And then here's a picture of that wheel on the car. Allen built, along with Pullman, his paper car wheel manufacturing company at Chicago and Pullman. This is the building that you see right here, and it was part of the Pullman uh, manufacturing place in Chicago. Now with his car accepted and the designs worked out, he started manufacturing. And these are just some drawings that show in those bursts, uh, the upper bursts and lower bursts, a porter making up the upper berth. He had places in Atlanta, he had places in Chicago, and he had places in Detroit. And this is uh, the car manufacturing in Detroit that he had. But he decided in early 1880, he asked Colonel James to secretly purchase 4,000 acres of land west of Lake Calumet, outside of Chicago, for $800,000. The property was acquired from 75 different owners. The actual site of the town, including Pullman's, did not occupy more than 300 acres. The residential portion of Pullman between 111th Street and 115th Street had 531 houses. Pullman was about 45 minutes from Chicago and the Illinois Central had their main line tracks going right by Pullman. So this is a drawing of Pullman. Uh, the manufacturing company uh, is on this end. Um, this is the uh, admin building with the tower. Uh, this is the water tower that you'll see uh, in later stories, uh, in later slides, excuse me. And then this is the residential end of the town. Uh, this is a fire insurance map of Pullman. And uh, I I'm just astounded at the size of this town that he, uh, he built. Uh, all the manufacturing was all done here. On the left side, there was a road that separated the manufacturing from the residential. Um, and then there were some fairly uh, significant buildings, but all these are single family lots. Some are duplexes, some are quads, uh, but it's just amazing the scale of it. So here's another view. This is a close-up view. They built the man-made lake. Uh, this is the tower with the admin section of the building. Uh, there's the water tower that you'll see later on. And then here's that main road here. And then this is the residential section of the town. And this is just the close-up to give you a better idea 
uh, the main car shops, there was a rectum shop. Uh, there was, um, this was the main admin building on this side. There were rectum shops. Uh, there were machine shops, tracks all over the place, repair shops, um, everything. And this is the admin building when it was first built. They had formed a lake. Uh, again, very early on, it had just been built. And then this was the Illinois Central Main Line. So this is the building completed, uh, the lake completed, wonderful stone wall around the lake. Um, just pretty impressive. Uh, and we went to visit about eight years ago, 10 years ago. So this is what's left. Um, the erection shops on this side are still there. The ones on the right side, on the residential side of the complex have been taken down. And then, so here's the tower, the lakes on this side, and these are now all gone. And you'll see some of these are gone. There's the water tower. So there's a view where we went. Some of these again are, are there. All the ones on this side were gone. And this is taken from the Hotel Florence. Uh, and this is from the other side of the admin building and the erection shops. And in background there, that's a Hotel Florence, which you'll see later on. And then there's just some uh, views of uh, this was the main building entrance where workers will, would come and go. They'd go home for lunch, they come back to work. And you notice they're all dressed. There was a strict dress code, not only for working, but also for living in your house and outside of your house. And here's some workers, they're heading home from work. Uh, of course, they didn't have cars back then, they didn't need them because they were walking, their houses were just um, down the road from where they worked. However, the houses were laid out. Uh, the management's houses were closer to the factory and the lower on the totem pole you were, the farther away your house was. But again, everybody was dressed. You would go to work, you take off your clothes, you put on your workers clothes. But whenever you were out in public, uh, you were, uh, dressed up. So um, this is the architect and landscape architect who did this project. And they're standing outside of uh, the admin building right next to the lake. So we're gonna look at some of the residential buildings and structures that were there. This is the Hotel Florence. Um, railroad owners would come stay here overnight and look at the cars they were gonna buy or if they were having a private car of their own design, they would come visit. There was a nice green uh, park. This was the arcade building where you, come, you could buy goods. There was a stables, there was a church. Uh, the station was down here. And then you can see single family homes, some duplexes, some quads, and then as further away, the lots get smaller and smaller. So again, this is a view of the admin building. That's the whole, uh, sorry, this is the Hotel Florence, and this is the arcade building. And then here's the park. Uh, this is the church. And this is the arcade building and you can see the water tower. I keep pointing this out because it sort of orients you to where everything was. The arcade building was pretty amazing. It was, um, it had taken their cues from London, England, which had these skylight arcades. It was two stories. You could go and shop. And if you just like to notice this sign, it says lowest Chicago, lower prices than Chicago which is not true. Everything in Pullman was expensive. You had to shop in Pullman. If you got on a train and left 
shopped somewhere else and came back and was seen carrying dry goods or groceries, you were reprimanded. Because, of course, Pullman wanted to make money. This is the second floor of the arcade. Um, there were shops on the second level. There was also a library, but you had to pay a fee to use the library. It wasn't free. There was also an 800 seat opera house. Again, you had to pay a fee. You couldn't just go in, in and enjoy a show or anything. You had to pay for it. This is the Hotel Florence. This is hotel was named after his daughter. Uh, Pullman had two daughters and two sons. Uh, the two sons were, for lack of a better term, spoiled brats. They, uh, he got them into Harvard and they flunked out of Harvard. Uh, they went to class drunk. I mean, they were just obnoxious. Um, when Pullman died, he left each son a thousand bucks, and that was it. Uh, he gave most of his money to Florence, who worked with him side by side at the company. Uh, his other daughter married a fairly wealthy person, and he left her money, but she didn't need it. So the Florence Hotel is still there. It, uh, it's a little tired. It needs some help. Um, and this was part of the tour that we had taken. Um, you can see the entry right there. Inside, pressed tin ceilings, pressed wallpaper, uh, amazing fireplaces, all wood carved. Here's the dining room at the Hotel Florence. Uh, and this is that same view. If we go back, these windows that you see here, uh, these windows here, uh, it doesn't get used very much. It's actually roped off. They had a school. Here's the church that I mentioned earlier that sat on the corner of the park. Uh, very nice church, uh, very well designed. Here's the inside of the church. Of course, if you went to church, you had to pay to go to church. It wasn't free. There was a market building where you would go and buy goods and buy what you needed. Of course, prices were set by Pullman. This is the train station at Pullman. This is a, a, a what used to be a fire station. They also had stables because back then they people used horses. Um, huge building. Horse head out of marble mounted on the side. And you can see a couple right here. That's what it looks like today. It's still there. And we're going to go into some of the residential neighborhoods. I mean, they're really nice. Um, it, it, it's pretty amazing. And uh, this is an upper management's house right here. This is some lower management housing. And then you start to see duplexes and quads, um, you know, no porches. Um, and this is just after they were built. Again, some more housing and again, not finished yet. The street extends, but they haven't built much more. Uh, this was the town manager's house. This was an arcade building where they sold stuff on the first floor and they had um, housing above. It's still there. So I'm going to read a, a passage here. The first permanent residents were the Benson family. They moved into town on January 1st, 1881. By April, the Pullman car shops were in operation, and by May, more than 350 people lived in Pullman. The original town of Pullman was completed in 1884. The average rent for a three-room apartment was $8 to $8.50. For rent for a five-room row house with basement and bathroom, 
with water faucet on each of the two floors was $18 a month. Larger home for professionals and company offices officers began at $25 a piece. Rents were calculated to achieve a 6% 6 return on the cost of the house. However, the investment never reached more than 4.5%. Housing in Pullman was somewhat more expensive than other parts of the city, but the quality was far superior than available to workers elsewhere. All Pullman homes had indoor plumbing and facilities and running water, event advantages unheard of in other working class areas of the day. The town cost $8 million to construct. And that's about $240 million in today's numbers. Pullman had told the board of directors, we will make 6% because we're gonna charge them for everything. They wanna use the church, we're gonna charge them. They wanna use the library, we're gonna charge them. They wanna use whatever, we're gonna charge them. They even supplied gas to heat the buildings and charge them. If you couldn't pay your bills, that was not an issue because when you got your check for work, they also wrote another check made out to Pullman for the cost of the rent, for the cost of the gas. If you went to the library, that was automatically taken out. You never saw it, you never paid a bill because they already took it out. There were two checks. Pullman would give you two checks, you would give one right back and you would keep whatever was left over. A great system. So we're just gonna have a few more views of some of the buildings in Pullman. And of course, this is probably a lower end worker, um, not even brick, very small house, wood frame, you know, a small little front porch. Again, there was a dress code. There was a dress code going to work, coming from work. Uh, there was a dress code when you were working inside. There was a dress code when you were going to church. There was even a dress code if you wanted to sit out on your front porch. And the rules were also that you actually couldn't sit on your front porch. You actually had to sit on the stairs. Because if you had looks, I should have mentioned this earlier, but if you look, there were never chairs on the porches. Pullman wanted you to sit on the stairs. There was no town government. You didn't get to vote on anything. Pullman managed the town. They did what they wanted, charged what they wanted. There was no local newspaper. Pullman put out a newspaper, but it was controlled by them. Everything was controlled by Pullman. So we're gonna take a tour of the complex. This is the gate, the main gate where workers would go in. They punch a clock before they even would get into the facility. Uh, and this is actually lunchtime. We're coming out from lunch. Uh, again, everyone's pretty much dressed. You're not in workers' clothes. And then there was another entrance to the property. Uh, they had some announcements on a board. And then this is a section in the middle of the complex. You can see overhead passes to connect buildings, uh, lots of tracks. This is a close up of the erection shops that were on the property. There was a transfer table between the admin building erection shops and the next set where they could actually roll out cars, roll them down and bring them in somewhere else and continue to work on them. So here's a picture of the water tower. Uh, this is the heating complex at the building, which we'll talk more about later. Another view of the water tower. Again, just huge complex. Again, you could go overhead to, to work in other parts of the building. And they were building all sorts of different cars, not just, you know, sleeping cars, all sorts of cars. They would bring in rails. Uh, you can see workers. This guy was probably a supervisor. 
The Pullman Company was powered by a coreless engine. This particular coreless engine was at the 1876 Centennial Exposition. Pullman purchased the coreless engine to supply power for the works in the town. It had been built by George Corliss of Providence, Rhode Island for Philadelphia's 1876 Centennial Exhibition. At the Centennial's opening, President Ulysses S. Grant has ceremoniously turned the silver crank to emit steam to its cylinders. It stood in the transept with the machinery hall, the focal point of the show. Its fame spread, known as Corliss, considered to be the most beautiful engine in existence. After the exhibit exhibition, it was returned to Providence for storage. Pullman's goal was to make this town the model of its kind, the workers productive, the complex a showcase. A small horizontal, less showy engine would have sufficed, but Pullman went full well recognized the promotional potential of the matter. He advised the world of his plans that it took 35 railroad cars to transport the Corliss from Providence to Chicago to be displayed for all to see. It was delivered in the 1880s, set up that winter, and put into service the following April. It stood on a raised platform surrounded by wide aisles for visitors to view at to vis for visitors to review. Only he charged for the tours. The engine room was 84 square feet. 65, 66 feet high around the operating base, maintained as spotless as a palace. The floor polished regularly and machinery touched up once a week. Press releases and tour guides exerted its qualities and painstaking resuscitation of its specification and massive size. Total weight, 200 tons, 11 ton walking beams, 38 foot diameter flywheels, 2,400 horsepower, propelled three miles of shafting and so on. Exaggerated as these claims may have been, the Corliss nevertheless delivered 20 years, 29 years of comparatively free and incredible service. A subject of technical papers and journals such as power, it was taken out of service in 1910 and scrap for $8 per ton. The Pullman Engine House, which is this building right here, is the one with the three large windows and the chimney behind it. And that's where the Corliss was housed. To the left of the engine house is the water tower. Just to give you an idea, the structure was 196 feet high, the tank capacity 550,000 gallons occupied the top portion of the water tower and provided 70 po 75 pounds of pressure on the mains. Lake Michigan was the source of portable water while water for the investor used by the shops was pumped from Lake Calumet. Several stories below the tanks were used for light manufacturing, storage and offices. I don't know if I'd wanna work underneath all that water. Um, and then these are just some views of the locomotives that were used in the yard at Pullman. This is called the dummy transfer engine. There were three of them. They were used to push cars onto the transfer table and move them to other sections of the complex. They were about 50 horsepower. They were steam driven. And here you can see the transfer table. And here's one of those, uh, the little, uh, uh, dummy transfer locomotive. You can see cars out here. And then here you can see one of the cars being taken out of the shop. Uh, when the Corliss got replaced, they got electric machine engines to actually move the cars instead of using the old dummy steam cars. So when they started building the cars, and when they first started, they were all wood frame cars. So you can see here's the platform of the car, here's the walls of the car, and then here's a drawing of how that car was to be framed. They had these, whoops. They had these design drafting areas where all the designs were taking place. Uh, this is just one section. 
Uh, but this is where the cars were designed, the furniture was designed, the inlay on the panels, the doors, the windows, you name it. And this is one of their turning shots where they turned woodworking for cars or for any decorative moldings and things they made. And it just goes on and on. It's a huge complex. And this is another shop. And as you can see here, the workers are in their work clothes. And this is two steel overhead cranes that we used to grab the steel that they needed and bring it into the building. And just piles of steel, just pretty amazing. Here they're starting to assemble parts for floors of cars. And then here you can see some of the floors have been assembled. This has the actual floor on it, the deck. Here's just the frame. And then it just, here's another frame, here's another frame, and just goes on. There was a steel press that could force 12 tons of weight to make any kind of molding that was needed. This is another place where they're doing patterns and doing moldings. Um, so here's where they're making wheels. You know, they got all the steel, the rods and everything and lays to turn everything. And then they're building their trucks. You can see them here, they're being assembled. And then for long pieces, and you can see all the drawings are laid out. In another section. And here they're building chairs and they're upholstering chairs. And you can see them all through. And then they just didn't, as I mentioned earlier, they just didn't do passenger cars. They also did box cars and other cars. And then this is, uh, I found this article and pulled it out. It's on how Pullman built their freight cars on an assembly line basis. They started at a bottom with the trucks, the frame, and they bring up the bottom, bring up the ends, and put the roof on. Well, Laz, at this point, I got a question I think is uh, like to toss out right now. Uh, George Bulow uh, asks, uh, although Pullman was considered a manufacturer, wouldn't we think of it in today's terms as an assembler, much in the manner of an automobile assembly plant? What was actually manufactured on the property? Where did the remaining supplies and parts come from? Uh, local they, they got raw materials and they made everything. They made everything. Okay. They made everything. And, and then I was just going to uh, ask a question. Um, you just mentioned that the, um, the freight car production was done on sort of an assembly line. Yeah. Um, it looked like the passenger erecting shops were basically the cars were sort of built in place or was that done on more of an assembly line? I think, I think it was built in place and then they would take the car out of the shop, roll it down to transfer, take it into someplace else and assemble the seating, assemble the finishes. So actually the car was moving between buildings rather than being on an assembly line like you see with these freight cars where everything was here and they put it together as it went down. But the car, the actual passenger cars were moved through buildings. So I guess it's kind of assembly line, but it's, it seemed kind of uh, cumbersome to do it that way rather than do like they did with the freight cars. Do you know when they started building freight cars? Because I I don't because Henry don't. Ford was credited with basically inventing the assembly line, and yeah, that I wasn't the really early part after. of the 20th century. I think this came after because they, they focused on sleeping cars to begin with, and I think once they got that down to a science, they started going after everything else. I mean, the guy was money hungry, I mean, uh, just, he didn't care, he wanted money. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, because the, the pictures you have up there now, I mean, these are these look to be more modern yes. street cars with steel yes. panel sections. Yep. Yeah, they okay. are. Okay. 
And then, you know, here's a view of the passenger car where they're doing all the, the painting and the, the elaborate designs that you're used to seeing on a Pullman car. And then here are the cars in an erection shop they've got them assembled. Um, and just, you know, you're not talking five or six cars, you're talking a huge amount. And then here they're sandblasting the, the metal cars, getting ready for paint. Um, originally cars did not have vestibules. They had open end platforms. And of course, when they collided with other cars, they tended to override the car in front of them or behind them. The basic premise of the vestibules was not new. Various designs existed, some of which were patented. They were used while those used widely were patented by Wagner Palace Car Company, known as the narrow vestibule. It just covered the width of the door. Pullman sued for patent infringement. The court ruled that each had prior rights to the sum of the features of the other. By 1893, Pullman's work superintendent, Harry Sessions, developed and patented the full width vestibule. So even though the court said he did not have complete rights, there's an ad in 1877 called the original vestibule. The vestibule, a Pullman invention, had been accounted the single greatest safety device in railroad travel. Enabling safe car-to-car -car passing, it included anti-telescoping construction to prevent cars from climbing over in a collision, and it holds the train in a rigid unit riding more smoothly and safely. So here's a view of a car that was an open platform at the ends, didn't have any vestibules. Here's one where there's no, a narrow vestibule that just encloses the door located in the center of the car. And here's another view of that uh, narrow vestibule. And then here's two cars coupled together. And then this is a, a fully closed vestibule the promotional piece had Pullman take full credit for the vestibules. At the time, he was known to exaggerate to stretch a point or two. This sales puffery extended even after his death to his, his successors, as this example, which appeared 25 years later, said he was in the inventor of the closed vestibule car. Pullman built the Max Serena, which was the name of his car. Uh, sorry, in the name of this car in 1893 for an exhibit at the year's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. It featured paper wheels, which are those, these guys down here. And if you see white wheels, those are paper wheels. Um, it also had full width vestibules. It was a combination baggage, buffet, and smoker. It had very ornate barbershop and a chair and a bathtub. And then here's just another view of that paper wheel. You know, the one on the right is black, but most of them were white, as you can see on this car. The World Columbian Exhibition was a pretty important event. It was dubbed the White City because all the buildings were white and they were all classical architecture. The only building that was colored was the transportation building. It was the first time electricity was used in public buildings. This is a night shot showing all the lights on that was done by the architect. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, all the lights on, which was pretty impressive. Here's the transportation building. It was very colorful. It was done by architect Louis Sullivan. And um, you may not know Louis Sullivan. He was pretty famous. But Many of you may have heard of Frank Lloyd Wright, and that's where Frank Lloyd Wright started to work in Chicago when he got there. So Pullman brought his cars to show off to the public. Um, they were staged, you know, they had porters. Uh, they were trying to impress the public. Uh, you could take tours. You were charged for the tours. There are pores there to talk about the car and there were sleepers and everything. The United States of America is to hold a World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. It was well known to all that it was the most stupendous, magnificent, and comprehensive exhibition 
of everything that pertains to the fears of life and development in any form. It is now generally considered that you will wish to see this wonderful site and that you will arrange, you will arrange to do so is highly probable. Therefore, the means of travel and the re relative merits of great transportation line of this country a subject of importance to each individual. This is one of the cars that he brought to show off. This is the interior. And then here are some other views. How important was the World Columbian Exhibition? Well, here's a Central Vermont Railroad flyer of special trains that went from Vermont. You could take a Central Vermont train and take a Pullman car with new mahogany vestibule, combination baggage and express car, commodious smoking car, and coaches of solid mahogany. So if they were doing it to Vermont, they were doing it all around the country. And here's the timetable. Um, that folded out and it had the World's Fair. It had sleeping parlor car rates. It had a map of Chicago. And then when you unfold it, it had a map of the World's Fair where all the buildings were located. And then the most important buildings with a little uh, description of each. And here's the transportation building again. And then I'm just going to show some common cars that Pullman had. There were a lot of variations on cars. They would make them custom if railroads wanted certain capacity or bursts. Um, but there are a number of uh, arrangements. Um, this was the most popular bar. It was, oh, sorry, sorry, I jumped ahead. So this is uh, one of the lounge cars. Uh, again, lounge car, and this is actually a bathtub. You could actually take a bath. Of course, uh, if you needed a haircut back in the day, and then here's a more modern uh, barbershop in a more modern car. Services that were sometimes provided, you could send telegrams, you could make phone calls. If you were a businessman, some trains had secretaries on board that could type letters, type messages that could be mailed. In 1937, he developed the Rumet car. This was the latest invention. Of course, he passed away. Of course, his pass away from the company that's coming with it. There were 18 roomettes, each complete with toilet facilities, individual air conditioning, and separate control of heat and light. It was very private. Um, and here you can see a passenger supposedly lowering the upper berth, but here's the bed folded out where the table was. You had a sink that folded down. There was a toilet compartment down below. All very private. And of course they did advertisements. Ask for a section instead of a lower. So they had whole cars that you could do a whole section to yourself and they would give you a discount. If you wanted a lower berth, $1.65, a number $2, single occupancy sections, $3.55. It was cheaper than a roomette because they didn't have bathrooms. Then one of the last ones, which did not last very long and wasn't too popular was the three tier sleeper. Remember those uh, shelf or bunk cars in the beginning? <laughs> um, so, they made other cars. Um, they made what they called immigrant cars. 
as more and more people came in the country and traveled to the Midwest and out West, they had immigrant cars. Uh, here's a map, uh, an advertisement to go out West to work. Uh, and here's these immigrant cars. They were packed full of people. Uh, very crude uh, conditions. But basically, there was just a platform. You could sit there. You could sit up here. You could sleep up here. But they were packed with people. These immigrant, immigrant cars were bare necessities. They were offered in various form. The crews were box cars with a few openings cut into the side or the ends for light and ventilation. Some had crude benches, shelves, burst of some form. Some had a primitive stove, wash and toilet facility. Some did not. Many were converted hand-me-down coaches or sleepers, otherwise only fit for non-revenue maintenance use. Uh, mass tool boarding cars, they were there specifically built for this purpose. Simply, simple open section uppers and lowers, primitive cooking, water and toilet facilities, and a bear of decoration. Traveler provided his bedding and refreshment or the railroad offered mattresses, covers, pillows for a few cents a night or 50 to 70 cents a trip, some were free. The purpose was to provide transportation for those who could least afford it, who did not require amenities of style and comfort. Many were accustomed to and willing to accept the bare essential essentials. In summary, no Victorian clutter. Holman also did street and elevated cars. This is 6th Avenue L. Pullman aggressively promoted his product to the elevators in New York. Had more than a casual interest for in 1878, he was elected to what must have been the original board of directors of the Gilbert Line, which then became the Metropolitan. It ran up Trinity Place and Church Street, then West Broadway via 3rd Street and onto 6th Avenue. This is a view of the north end on 6th Avenue from 9th Street. It shows the first train with Pullman cars on the Gilbert Elevator. April 29th, 1878. Traction was by a steam dummy engine intended to valve in, valve in rod motion and hiss and steam from you to minimize the startling of horses. Yet they're shy at clanging and banging on the rails and, steep and street structure. And this is a close up view of the cars where Pullman provided 147 through 1886. The interior looked outright generous, advises that this line provides opulent service with extraordinary carpeting and tree chandeliers with improved kerosene lighting. Must be nice to sit on board and sell aboard and, and sell aboard 147 cars, no conflict. So let me try that again. It must be nice to sit on the board of the railroad and then sell 147 cars to the railroad. No conflict of interest. He also came up with the world's first electric locomotive, according to him. This was delivered in 1888. It was a unique boxcar locomotive. This is a Hansonia Derby in Birmingham. It was, whoops, sorry. It was powered by a large bi op bipolar electric motor. The original is pictured on the right. It took one and refurbished it, and that's what you're seeing on the right. Holman also did streetcars. And this is example one. He ventured in the streetcar business in the 1880s. His brother, Charles Lewis Holman, ran this division for the company. I threw these in here, but these are kind of unique. Uh, it was a streetcar that was pulled by a patent motor car, two-decker, packed with people going down the street. This was Columbian streetcar, they called it. Then he got together with George Sessions out of California to build what they called the Sessions car. Sessions owned a railroad called the Highland Park and Fruitville Street Railroad where he helped promote and sell. Pullman sold him five cars. When he did, his pastors could ride on top and he cooked and sold food at the lower level. 
This is the Hayes Palace studio car. This was a converted Pullman car that Jay Hines in 1885 established for himself. He was a photographer. He took it out west and he photographed Yellowstone and other parks. But the other thing that he did as he went to different towns and offered to take pictures for people, small towns out west didn't have a local photographer. So instead he went out there and went from town to town. He had a timetable where he would be in town so people could come and have their photos taken. He developed them there and he would sell them to the people. This is a Northern Pacific exhibit car. It was a tour going out west and how scenic it was. It had a parlor car with a library in it. The library had 39,000 photos of all the national parks that Jay Hines took. It had a museum car which had stuffed animals that were out west, pictures and all sorts of stuff. Here's the exhibit car it was to promote people going out west and travel to the east and went from city to city and used as a promotional tool. They even had a cathedral car of North Dakota. Built in 1890, it was a traveling church. It would go into towns and people could come and worship. Even Rexall Drugs had their own train. It was done by Pullman. They had it where you, you could teach pharmacy and teach druggists. Of course, after they got taught, they would go into the pharmaceutical store and buy all their drugs to sell to the towns they lived in. They also had hunting excursion trips that Pullman promoted where you could rent a train and you could go on a trip, go hunting, and come back with your wares. This one was going to Tal Tallapoosey, Georgia and returning. From Boston, it was 50 bucks. From Hartford, 55 bucks. And from New York and Philadelphia, 50. If you didn't want to do an excursion with anyone else, you could rent your own hunting camp car. It was basically a car done for hunting and everything you could, could stay in it, sleep, eat, then whatever you, then you take it wherever you want to go. You could go hunting. You had a place to go at night after the hunt. Pullman also rented cars. This was the first car that Pullman rented. Supposedly it was his car and he used it and got it got rented out once in a while, but it was really his car. Here's George Eastman of the Kodak Company. He didn't own his own car, but he rented a car. He rented this particular one. He had it designed and it had a piano in it. Though it wasn't his own, he rented it and had it anytime he wanted it. Here's one of Vanderbilt's private cars that they had built. It had two of these made. This particular one had a fireplace. It was pretty lavish, as you can see from the photos. I had to include this. Um, I don't know how, know how many people know about this. Admiral Bird was going to do an Antarctica trip. A bunch of manufacturers got together and they built the Antarctica Snow Cruiser. It was built in Pullman and it was meant to carry people inside and keep them warm when it was 100 degrees below zero in Antarctica. It could hold the plane, the plane could land on it, it was supposed to transverse all snow conditions. Well, not quite. Here it is being built at, being built at Pullman. Here's the frame sitting on trucks. Here's the wheels that were added. It's just a lot of it didn't make sense. Its length was 55 feet. It carried five passenger airplane on the roof. The width was 15 feet. The height was 15 feet. The wheelbase was 20 feet. It weighed 75,000 pounds. The rubber tires had a 10 foot diameter and were 34 inches across. It cost 150,000 and had two horsepower diesel engines that were hooked to electric motor in each wheel. So this was supposed to trudge through snow. It had round smooth tires. The exhaust was directed to the tires to keep them warm when it was out in Antarctica to keep the rubber from freezing. Talk about not even getting off the boat. When it was put on the boat and shipped, 
They built a ramp, they crushed the ramp, fell off the ramp. And you can see over here, the ramp's destroyed. You can see it almost fell off completely. But they actually did get it out to Antarctica. It went out, the first storm hit, it got stuck. They couldn't move it. The theory was if you needed more traction, you could extend the axle and put two tires on, but they were smooth tires. So it ended up getting stuck. They left it. It got buried in the snow, but the guys lived in it anyways and did all their experiments and everything they were supposed to do, but it was buried under snow. It never worked as promised. Supposedly it's still somewhere out there buried in the snow because they ended up leaving it. And you can see here this little hatch that's been built so they could go down inside it. And you could see how they extended the axle and added more tires, but of course, smooth rubber tires don't give you much uh, traction. Of course, there were some issues. Pullman didn't pay his porters very much. In fact, he didn't pay any of the salary people very much. Uh, the porters made good money when business was good because they got a lot of tips. But when they didn't get tips and business wasn't good, they didn't get paid very well and it was a struggle to survive. The other thing it was, there was a little recession in the 1890s and we'll see some numbers. The recession was the fact for Pullman, he wasn't making as much money as he could. He was still making money, but not as much as he wanted. So he cut wages. And this is a couple cartoons uh, with the porters and Pullman, and they're showing examples how their wages are going down, down, and down. And you know, low wages, high rent, here's the employee, and uh, Pullman is squeezing every nickel out of it. So he didn't lower the rent, he didn't charge less for the gas or any other charges. He kept it the same, but he cut wages and he cut hours. So workers decide to strike. He didn't cut management salaries, only hourly people. So the workers went on strike. And you can see here, um, you, you can see assets. You can see, uh, you can see actually a number of cars that were built. It was pretty amazing route miles that his cars went on, but you know, profit and loss, pretty big numbers. And then he had a loss, but when it dropped, he cut his wages. He cut, didn't want to pay him. And you can see here, April, uh, let's see here, April 93, you can see what they were making. April 94, they went from 37 to 24 uh, men. They were making 54, 57, 93. In 1894, they were making 37, 76. And it just down the line. But they still had the same cost for rent, for gas, everything. So the strike was uh, pretty nasty in 1893. Um, and in 18... Just to give you an idea, in 1868, they had 50 cars. They were growing amazingly fast. In 1890, they had built 2,100 cars. They peaked during World War II with 8,500 8, cars. And this is the route miles that the cars ran. He had great assets and he had lots of money, as you can see. This is what he grossed and this is his profit. So in 1890, he had a profit of $4,563. Hundred and seven hundred dollars in eighteen ninety five. He had a profit of six million six twenty three four hundred. Oh, and as you need to go back a slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here we go. Sorry. Um, but he wasn't making as much money as he thought or thought he should have. So he cut hours and he cut salary. And then we go to the next one, which we talked earlier. You could see how we cut their wages how we cut the number of people working. So they struck. Um, this was a small company when you think about it compared to the US. Uh, you would have thought this would not have been a big deal because it was a small company. 
However, um, they had other rail workers that were unionized and decide to support their fellow workers in Chicago. And they decided they would not touch a train with a Pullman car. You might say, what's the big deal? The big deal is mail went by train. And usually the mail was on a train that had Pullman cars. So the mail wasn't going and people wouldn't get, weren't getting their mail. That was a big deal. No one was getting mail. People were complaining. So the U.S. government stepped in. Um, the strikers had burnt cars. You can see burnt cars here. You can see trucks. Um, the government brought in the National Guard to protect the property at Pullman. Um, and you can see National Guard by the trains, by the passenger cars, uh, and out here on the property. And, you know, they must have been terrified because here's the arcade building. And look at the number of National Guard people, you know, protecting this building. At Hotel Florence, they had set up their headquarters. They had its tent out, out front of Hotel Florence, sort of something like that happened recently in D.C. with the upright, with the, the Russian the capital in Chicago. The cavalry would escort trains out of towns so strikers couldn't damage them and stop them. Cavalry run on top of trains to protect trains, but Pullman wouldn't but fun, budge. He said, I'm not going to give them anything. If they want to strike, strike. They're going to get fired. There was a negotiation, negotiation team that came to meet with him. And he said, look, this is what we need. These are the struggles. You said you always cared about your workers. He walked out of the meeting. He said, you guys are fired. You don't have any jobs. We'll move you out of town. You'll be gone by the next day. All he cared about was making a buck. It ruined his reputation. The strike was no good, but it was finally over. The government ended up breaking the strike. The workers went back to work, but his reputation was killed because he made it all about money. I'm going to build this town where people can work. They'll be happy. They'll have the best of everything. They'll have well-paying jobs. His reputation just went down the toilet. A couple of years later, after the strike, he died. He passed away. And they said, rumors were that the strike killed him. That he just, it just did him in. But the workers hated him with a passion for what he had done to them. He was buried in a concrete vault. And eight feet of concrete was placed on top of his vault because they were concerned that workers would unbury him and desecrate his dead body. Um, Robert Todd Lincoln was general counsel of Pullman Palace Car Company under George Pullman and was named president after Pullman's death in 1897. According to Almost Lindsay's 1942 book, The Pullman Strike, Lincoln arranged to have Pullman quietly excused from the subpoena issued for Pullman to testify in the 1895 trials of leaders of the American Railway Union for conspiracy during the 1894 Pullman strike. Pullman hid from the deputy marshal sent to his office with the subpoena, then appeared with Lincoln to meet privately with Judge Grossup after the jury had been dismissed. In 1911, Lincoln became chairman of the board, a position he held until 1922. So we know they built passenger cars, very fancy passenger cars. Um, this is the interior of one of the cars. And, you know, when you can get color shots, it's just, Color does it justice. Black and white does not. So he also built Pullman buses, trolley buses. He did this, which I find fascinating. This is a trolley sleeper. 
believe it or not. I mean, it must be a very long trolley ride that you need to have a sleeper. And this is in the, the interior of the sleeper. These are berths that fold down. The compartment's removable, so you can make a single-person sleeper. You can make it a bedroom sleeper. Uh, the berths will pull down. This was the last of the cars that Pullman built. It was the first Amtrak, first version of the Superliners, the last set of cars they built. They even shipped cars to Europe. This is a set of cars going to Brazil. They could never get the in international market. England, they sent a couple cars, but they just weren't successful. There's, the most successful one was Mexico. They had a lot of cars in Mexico. Um, and I just have a few ads. I mean, the ads fascinate me. Um, here's a bride talking, but you have to get me here. You have to get to here tomorrow. A Pullman car will get you there. I like to be comfortable when I travel. Gracie Allen. Um, and a lot of promotional, a lot of women. Uh, here's a woman with a drink, cigarettes on the table, two ladies uh, traveling together. And these must have been risque when they first came out. But, you know, a lady walking out with a towel in the shower, uh, a lady in her berth, someone in the bathroom getting ready to go to the upper berth. Um, so here's one of the uh, freight cars they did. They did for the Rutland. They also built a baggage car for the Rutland as well. This is a Montpelier and Wells River inner urban service baggage car mixed car. And this is on the transfer track at uh, Pullman. This Pullman car rode on the CV Central Vermont Ambassador. And then here is uh, the Ambassador uh, with the Pullman car at Essex Junction in Vermont. And here's another one on the Montrealer. And then here's a CV passenger car with Pullman cars on it. And even the Rutland had a Pullman, had Pullman service. This is at Burlington, Vermont. And then here's a Pullman, Canadian National Pullman car in uh, St. Albans. I'm sorry, the previous one was Burlington. Did I say St. Albans? This is in Burlington. Um, Pullman also had fashion shows. And I don't know if it was done to increase women ridership, but as you notice, there's some men uh, taking part as well. But their ads were just amazing, you know, short lesson in, 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 in the body, I can't say that word. All the conveniences of riding in a Pullman car. You know, daddy will come back safe and sound. He's going by Pullman. Privacy, women appreciate it. The Pullman single occupant, occupancy section. But Pullman wouldn't have worked without the porters. And who took care of the passengers? The porters. The porters were the ones who did all the work in the cars. The first Pullman porter began working aboard sleeper cars around 1867 and quickly became a fixture of the company, a sought after traveling experience. Just like all of his specifically specially trained conductors were white, Pullman recruited only black men, many of them from former slave states in the South to work as porters. Their job was to lug luggage, shine shoes, set up and clean up sleeping berths, service passengers. 
Pullman was open about his reason for hiring Negro porters. He reasoned that former slaves would know how best to cater to his customers every whim and they would work long hours for cheap wages. He also thought black porters, especially those with darker skin, would be more invisible to his white upper and middle-class passengers, making it easier for them to feel comfortable during this journey. He was looking for people that had been trained to be the perfect servant. The historian Larry Tile, author of Rising from the Rails, The Pullman Porters, and The Making of the Black Middle Class, he knew they would come cheap and he paid them next to nothing. He knew there was never a question of, of there was never a question. Off the train, you would be embarrassed running into one of Pullman's porters, but despite the undeniable racism behind Pullman's employee practices, he ended up giving advantage to people who desperately needed them. In the early 1900s, a time when many other businesses wouldn't hire African Americans, <coughs> excuse me, um, the Pullman Company became the largest single employer of black men in the country. Working as a Pullman porter became a coveted job, even a career, and many brothers, sons, and grandsons of porters followed in their footsteps. Porters were paid more than what many other black workers made at the time, and the work was not backbreaking when compared to field labor. More importantly, they got to travel the country at a time when this was unthinkable for the vast majority of Black Americans. As Pullman porters became famous for their superior services, many former porters moved on to jobs at fine hotels and restaurants. Some even moved up to the White House. Porter J.W. Mays first served President McKinley, McKinley in his sleeping car. He would later, later spend more than four decades in the White House, serving McKinley and eight presidents who followed him. In the 1920s, the largest private employer of American, African Americans was the Pullman Palace Car. Pullman car, cars leased out to railroads, but owned and managed by the main company, offered a luxury travel experience. For black men working as a porter, was one of the few available jobs that paid a bit better than field labor. All porters were required to answer to the name of George, after company founder George Pullman. A custom carried over from slavery when slaves were addressed by their master's name. Porters often worked 400 hours a month with little rest. The Pullman rule book allowed for three hours of sleep the first night out and none for the remainder of the trip. American Railroad Union had organized most Pullman employees in the early 1890s, but excluded black porters. Yet during its 1894 strike, the company made black workers replace those who refused to work, therefore dulling the strikers' impact. For years, Pullman porters organized for better wages and treatment, but gains were small. Moreover, the company refused to recognize or bargain with them. In 1925, the group of workers convinced A. Philip Rudolph, a black socialist and publisher of the radical Negro magazine, The Messenger, to become president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. The magazine published their demands, which included a living wage instead of tipping a 240-hour work month and four to six hours of rest each night. The federal government denied the union's demands for recognition. It also refused to force Pullman to provide living wage. The company, meanwhile, fired hundreds of workers for organizing. One of the keys to the union's eventual victory was the Colored Women's Economic Council, founded by the wives of Pullman Porters. Their auxiliary group raised money for the effort and organized letter writing campaigns that supported labor friendly legislation. They often held their meetings where their husbands were on the road and could not be suspected of organizing. And finally, in 1934, the American Federation of Labor accepted the Porters Union 
as a full member and help them convince the federal government to extend protections for their union activity. As mentioned earlier, the conductor was white, the porters were black, anyone working in dining cars were black, service was of the utmost importance. There were rules about caring for passengers. The Pullman conductor would check someone in, the porters would take them to their rooms. This was a way for Pullman to confront, I'm sorry. Back at Pullman, sorry. So this, the conductor would check someone in, port. this is a card diagram sheet which says how much was charged, how many people and where they were going. This way, this was a way for Pullman to confirm ticket sales with these card diagrams. Back at Pullman, you see at the upper right, women typing out tickets. Lower right, there's 20 women sorting tickets daily so that receipts can be distributed. Upper left is one day's card diagrams. In accordance with the Interstate Congress, Congress Commission rules, Diagram and tickets were kept for three years in 17 rooms in Pullman storage building. On the lower right is one day supply of 80,000 tickets that had been sorted, classified, checked, and audited. So it was quite an undertaking. So if you want to go on a Pullman train, you had to buy two tickets. Here you see Central Vermont timetable. Only line from New England run in Pullman Palace cars, drawing room and sleeping cars, which is not true. The Rutland ran Pullman cars as well. They ran sometimes ran specials to New York, 650 a round trip in Pullman cars, but you had to pay two prices. You paid the CV for your ticket to board the train, and then you paid Pullman for your berth for your sleeping car. So Pullman would issue a ticket, how many passengers, what their berth they were in. You would buy the ticket from CV and then, and this would be the agent stub. It's going from White River to New York. It says where the berth is. It says what the cost is. It says the date, room at seven on train 700. So you go to the station and you go right to the Pullman passenger conductor. You wouldn't go to like nickel plate in this case. You would go present your ticket and you would be taken into the train. The porters would grab your luggage, take it onto the train, help you get on the train. They would greet you, carry your luggage, bring you to your room. As you can see here in these examples. Of course, in the lounge car, they would serve you drinks. In the dining car, they would serve you food. They would pick up, they would clean, they would shine shoes, and each Pullman had a separate door where he could put your shoes in from the outside and not bother you from the inside and not bother you. And from the inside, you would have access to your shoes. And you can see this little door here where they're placing the shoes. They had a counter car, and again, you would be served by Pullman. They would get your bed ready or your berth ready, and they'd have it ready when you're ready to go to sleep. Sometimes it got a little hectic, and it was one Pullman porter per car. But you can see here, he's prepping the berth, he's hanging the curtains, he's bringing one of the berth passengers something to drink. And of course, you could sleep well, be refreshed for the next day. If a Pullman porter got a chance, they would sleep in these three tier cars. They were allowed to eat in the dining car after everyone else had eaten, but they would have to pay for half the cost of their meal. The meal was not covered. They would have to pay for it. 
Laundry was a big thing. They're hanging out mattresses to get clean and to get fresh air. All the cushions are out. You're cleaning the car. Probably the business, biggest expense was taking care of laundry. They also had to take care of cars, clean out the cars, replace any parts that needed replacing, do maintenance on cars, and they had facilities throughout the country. The cars did not go back to Pullman. They had maintenance and repair shops to replace appropriately throughout the country. You can see here they're vacuuming, they're replacing parts, they're doing exterior work. They also had yards with some of the major railroads so they could store their cars and they could make up trains at a moment's notice. If an extra train was needed, they had the ability to do that. That was one of the things that Pullman was able to do. They could create trains in a matter of hours. Here's a train being taken care of one of their maintenance shops, as you can see right here. And then you can see the yard with all the Pullman cars stored, ready to be assembled if needed. They also sent to railroads promotional material. Here from the Pullman company to Central Mont reads, I am forwarding you this mail, four photographs illustrating the single section occupancy and the conveniences of this new unit of accommodation put into effect May 1st, which I believe will be of interest to you and possibly illustrate the value for reproducing per progress in some of your advertising matters. And we'll end with the CV heading south with the Pullman at the end of the train. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Dave, back to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Laz. Uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, we, uh, not too much attrition. Uh, we lost about... Uh, six or seven people over the course of the uh the program uh not bad uh and uh so we do have a number of questions i'm just going to start at the top um so um uh, if you have an additional question for laz uh that you'd like answered during the official part of the program uh type it in now and we'll try to get to it uh i do want to try to wrap things up uh uh, at least the program part of it by 10 o'clock. So it doesn't give us a lot of time. Uh, back near the beginning, uh, Dennis Picker asked, uh, what was the state of affairs regarding sleeping cars on European railroads when Pullman started to build a sleeping car business? I don't know. I, di I didn't research European cars. I know he tried to go to Europe, but he wasn't successful at all. And that's about all I know. Okay. Um, Matt Menzi, uh, referring to the uh, the wheels with the paper cores, uh, uh, comments that they must have caught fire occasionally. That had occurred to me too. Was that an issue with those wheels? I, I never heard that mentioned. I mean, they were enclosed in steel plates, so the paper wasn't exposed. I mean, it, it, if if that wheel caught fire, it had to go through the steel plate to get to the paper. So it was the the the, the core the the center of the wheel was sort of like a um, an Oreo cookie. Yes. Let me okay. uh, let me just go back real quick so you can see it. You, it's going to be way back at the beginning of the program. Yeah. <clears throat> well, while, while you're, oops. Yeah, you can still answer questions while I go back. Okay. Uh, uh, George Bulow asks, uh, what was the nature of Pullman's financial deal with the railroads? Uh, the cars were company property. Did they uh, pay demerge the rail line? Haulage cost? How was a privately owned car managed? Uh, did the owner deal directly with each railroad or, or under contract? Did Pullman manage the movement of such cars? And uh, how did the railroads deal with luxury cars produced by Pullman competitors? So a lot of questions packed into that. Well, when Pullman first convinced um, the railroads to take on his car, um, I'll give you an example. 
I believe um, there's one example that I read about. This particular railroad charged a dollar fifty for a sleeper, and Pullman said, um, "I'll charge two dollars." And he said, "No one's going to ride your car." And Pullman said, "Oh yes, they will, because it's a lot better car than your car." So what happened was they put the car on the train and the railroad ended up taking their sleeper off the train because no one rented it and they rented the Pullman instead at a higher value. So I don't know quite the arrangement um, in terms of what Pullman paid the railroad to basically pull their car. Um, I didn't get into those details. Um, so I, I really can't answer what that arrangement was. Okay, I uh, guess we'll uh, we'll move on and so can we just so this is yeah, a steel please. plate <laughs> and there's a steel plate on the other side and they're bolted together and the paper is actually sandwiched inside. So the paper would be protected, right? There's no way. I mean, it's not going to burn through metal before it gets to the paper. And and the purpose of the paper core was to reduce noise and vibration. Yep, and make it a softer ride, which I don't understand how it did since there were two steel plates on the outside. But supposedly it did. They used it for twenty years. Okay, George also asked regarding the strike. Uh, he says he assumes that it would the governor would be the governor who would activate the national guard, not the federal government, and then. From the point of view of federalism and the separation of powers, how can the state take action to protect federal mail? I think that's why the feds stepped in because of the mail. Okay. It wasn't it wasn't a state issue, it was a, a federal issue because the mail wasn't being moved. So I don't know if the feds said to the state or to get the National Guard out. I, I don't know how that how that happened. Okay. A um, couple questions from uh, Dave Sharp. Um, first, ask how long did the strike last? I don't know how long it lasted. Okay. Sorry. And then, um, uh, with regard to the uh, advertising that the Pullman Company did, uh, did they develop their own ads and promotion in house or? But I believe they did. I believe they did everything in house. They weren't. They weren't the type of company to go outside of the, for lack of a better term, the family. Uh, Richard Monahan asks: uh, Were there any re smoking restrictions? Uh, given the era, I would assume no. No. In fact, that that one picture of uh, the lady sitting in the. Uh, in the dining car there, she had a pack of cigarettes sitting on the table where today you probably would see a cell phone instead. Exactly, yeah. Okay, uh, Len Batchelder uh, says, in the pictures of the old bench cars, there didn't seem to be any means uh, to, I think he means get to the upper berths. Did they have ladders like the later section cars did? They must have. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Lucius Charaviglio, if I got that right, uh, says on the paper wheels was leakage of water around the plates into the paper a problem? I never heard from everything I've read. I never heard that it was a problem. Uh, John Gilman asks, uh, didn't the manufacturing of cars have to be separated from the sleeping car operation? And second part of the question, how did the car manufacturer come to be called Pullman Standard? Um, I don't know the answer to the first one. The second one was the name he went to the state legislature of Illinois to get that name for the company. And he got them to uh, 
recognized his company as the Pullman Standard Palace Car Company. Okay. Uh, Ed Sterling asks, uh, says, he visited Hill Dean, the uh, Robert Todd Lincoln mansion there in Southern Vermont. Uh, there they claimed he was the president of the Pullman Company. They have a Pullman car on display at a special exhibit just below the Hill Dean mansion. It was some effort to get, he says that was some effort to get it up there. It was Lincoln the president of the company at some point? Yes, that's what I talked about after the strike, after Pullman died. Pullman was a general counsel, I'm sorry, Lincoln was a general counsel in the Pullman company. And he's the one who got Pullman out of having to testify when the workers took him to court. Um, and then when Pullman died, Lincoln advanced to president and served, I believe, for 11 years as president of the company. I had talked about that earlier. Hang on a second. Because uh, I had mentioned it. I said 1895 trials of the leaders of the American Railroad Union for conspiracy during the 1894 Pullman strike. Pullman hid from deputy marshal sent to his office with a subpoena and then appeared with Lincoln to meet privately with Judge Goscup after the jury had been dismissed. In 1911, Lincoln became chairman of the board, a position he held until 1922. Okay, great. Um, one of the, in the comments section, um, Wikipedia uh, says Pullman strike dates May 11th, 1894 to July 20th, 1894. Um, a lot of stuff here in the, I'm not going to read all the chat, but uh, out loud, but uh, uh, Michael Burns says that Pullman Standard came from the merger with Standard Steel Car Company in uh, 1934. And uh, George Bulow adds he thinks the formal name was Standard Press Steel Company. A lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of experts here in the, uh, <laughs> the, the chat there. Um, well, there's a lot to cover. And I, you know, yeah, I there didn't. Is. I didn't cover um, every single thing. No, obviously, you, you, we'd be here all night if you did. Um, so one last uh, uh, question, comment from Tom Chase. Says the narrow vestibules were in service and the Pullmans involved in the 1891 East Thompson, Connecticut wreck. Um, it says we had to model them when we built an HO model of the wreck. Interestingly, the famous white train or ghost train on the same route was not vestibule stock. One narrow vestibule car is presumed to be an old railroad museum. So anyway, um, I think that is about it. So unless there's any further questions, I just want to thank all of you who uh, were part of the program. We peaked at uh, 70 people on the Zoom and eight or nine on the, uh, on the Facebook uh, live stream. So 